Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Got a little something special for you. This is three guys before the game with a special in studio guest. We haven't had many of those in a long time. Welcome in, everybody. It's a Mountaineer legend joining us on Three Guys Before the Game. Hall of Famer, WVU. Still after, like, he hasn't played in, like, 95 years. He still owns the school record for most tackles in a single. In 95 or 96 years, he's been out. It's Steve Dunlap, a foundational piece in West Virginia's football history. And this is Three Guys Before the Game with Steve and the Senator Brad Howe. And it's brought to us by Burdette Camping Center, the only RV warranty forever provider in the state of West Virginia. You heard what I said. The warranty lasts forever. It's Burdette Camping Center, serving Mountaineer fans from, you guessed it, top of the state, bottom of the state, side of the state, to the other side. We're in Welch, Martinsburg to Matewan, all points in between for more than 40 years. Burdette Camping Center, the one-stop shop for your RVs, parts, service, sales, Check them out on the website, BurdetteCamping.com. They're located not too far where Steve was reared. Right? Steve's a hurricane guy. Burdette Camping, located in wonderful Winfield at the corner of 34 and uh, Route 34 and uh, 817. Check them out at BurdetteCamping.com. If you're a cool mountaineer, then you drive a Burdette Camping RV into the lots. This guy's been tough to get. I mean, this is absolutely an impossibility if everything was normal because Dunlap goes to Canada Dunlap goes to Canada the first the first leaf that comes off of a tree the first butt of a leaf that comes off of a tree in Morgantown he gets in his 99 foot trailer boat and just to Canada and doesn't come back until the leaves are off the tree but the pandemic got him you're not allowed, man. All these years you've been alive, the first time you've not been allowed into a country. <laughs> Locked out. You've been kicked out of a lot of bars, but no countries before. That's true. That's true. Thanks for coming in, man. Enjoy it. So you're, in all seriousness, your regular routine as far as going up to Canada goes from when to when? Well, since I retired from the end of May to the end of September. Yeah, that's a good run. That's a good run. Last year you fished how many days in Canada? Over 100 days in a row. 100 days in a row. And how many of them fishy did you catch? Over 1,000. Caught over 1,000 fish. Here's the wild part of it. How many of those did you keep, Steve? None. I'm sorry. My mic. Did your, did your headphones Zero. just crack Zero? Over? Zero? Not even like one day you kept some? You don't catch them You up? don't keep well, one fish. Well, the wife fish. is not big. You know, I was looking for a wife that clean fish <laughs> and cook fish. Miss Wendy doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just one day you'd think you'd say, okay, I'll clean the thing and eat it. I want to see what it tastes like. Uh, well, we when it used to be a lodge, it was originally a lodge, and they used to cook them for you. That You could take them up after breakfast, and they would clean them and cook them for you. So, What kind of fish are you catching up there? Well, mostly bass, largemouth, smallmouth. There's, there's pike, muskie, and walleye. Yeah. What's the one fish that you have to hit in the head because they could get dangerous when they get on there, when they get a Bowfin. Bowfin? Yeah. Mean, nasty fish with teeth. <laughs> nasty. You, you kind of got to give them a little bit of a... Yeah, little... I just wish they'd just go away. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing, man? How are you handling this thing here? This, this well, I'm pit? ready to run the St. Lawrence River right now. <laughs> You think know. you're going in They'll sideways? Never know. You huh? think you'll go in? You go back door on them? Get go in? Back door, just run the river. How get about it. the canal? Erie Barge Canal, does that help you out at all? You kind of just kind of go <laughs> up and kind of get in there? Up your way. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. We go Buffalo and cross the Peace Bridge. That's where we usually go. Besides your family, your pride and joy is your boat. It, it's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about this boat. Steve lives in my development. Oh yes, we're neighbors. We're neighbors, and I and his garage is always open, and in very and he and number one, he's bummed out because his garage isn't big enough, and so his boat has to be parked in Some sideways. Guy. Yeah. And then the door is open, and I'll just like it's clockwork. I'll drive by, and I just was he, well, is he cleaning it or yes. is he sitting in it? No, no, he's cleaning it. I, I just see a hand going. Hey, you got to wear sunglasses what? to see my boat, and, the, and when the sunlight goes, it'll blind you. It's so shiny. Yeah. Yes. We need, coat. we need to get you down Struggles. to, you need an RV too. So we need to get him down to Burdette Camping. Well, they do. take care yeah, of him. Yeah, they take care of him. 
You well, told since me. I played at Hurricane, I'm not allowed to go to Winfield. Those are <laughs> oh, bitter rivals. Statute of limitations. Back in the day, statute of uh, limitations. Statute of limitations. Over. You yeah. told me something a couple, about a month or so ago when we were chatting that I didn't know. And it's kind of a continuing funny story here. We, did, we out of the blue one day, Greg Hunter on Sportsline told us that he was heavily involved in the horse. He was a horse kid when he grew up, Ray Horses. Then Brad brings in a picture when he's five and a half years old on a horse that's like as, as big as like Secretariat. Like it wasn't a tiny horse. I was driving a, a, a man's horse. I mean, a it was man's. a big horse. You were a horse. Little, you, just live right up on the big horse. You were a horse guy. I was a cowboy. Yes. So that made you move from how? So what well, was that? originally, my dad's business, he, he had a garage and service station in Nitro, and we lived in Nitro until I was 13. And my dad loved horses, and we ended up moving to Hurricane because of that. We bought a small farm, and we showed horses, my, me and my sister, Colleen. How about that? So we you're trained you, some, and yeah, we, we had a good time. What age were you there? What were you in? Were you were into that one? I was, well, we first started, we had uh, ponies called Thunder and Lightning. They were paint ponies little ponies and we won our first trof trophy at st alvin's it was pair riding me and my sister and i still we still good we kept that trophy uh -huh. and we have a picture both of us setting the horse and holding the trophy from the side it was pretty neat <laughs> so you were how old for that i was shoot i was probably 10 my sister was probably six and you did it how long were you were you with oh, or? until football got in the way in high school so but you, wait a second, what about seven on seven when you were like nine years old and ten years old? What about that? What about all that football the camp, that you camps, played? Camp camps. circuit. You were yeah. on the camps. You know, camp circuit and stuff. How'd you do that? Well, you believe it or not, I didn't play a lot of football. I played I played midget league football. I was a quarterback, and, you know, I should have been a quarterback. I don't know what happened. <laughs> My left hand, I looked like Stabler. Yeah, I would imagine. Very, yeah, yeah very so, similar. So anyway, so what happened? I, and we moved the hurricane because of showing the horses. Riding. We built a barn. We had thirteen acres, and anyway, so I didn't play. I didn't play football in the seventh grade. I didn't play in the eighth grade. But we were showing horses, and in the ninth grade, the coach, the coach McGee taught me into coming out, and I did make all conference at tight end. Wouldn't they got you play, away from wouldn't court, let me right? play defense then. Tenth grade, I didn't like the coach much, so I didn't play. Didn't play in tenth grade. Sat out a year. Exactly, redshirted. Gap year. <laughs> Gap well, anyway, year. so my high, my junior high coach, Coach McGee, became one of the assistant coaches. You know, my junior year, so I played my junior and senior year, and my junior year, they wouldn't let me play defense. I was a backup monster. Seriously. Okay? So, so you so didn't play stuff, defense. All that, all that camp stuff. You know, you, you got to learn all this bull. If you can play, you can play. Okay. Yeah. So. So what ended up happening, my junior year, about halfway through the season, there's, we had two really good big linebackers. Both of them played West Virginia Conference, and they both got hurt. And we're getting ready to play Polka, one of our rivals. Dots. In Putnam County, yeah. Polka Dots. Showdown with the Dots, yeah. And, and I said, Coach, let me try that. So I played middle linebacker and had 13 titles, and the rest of it's history, I guess. <laughs> so, so that's how you got in there. You yeah. Wally pipped those guys. Exactly. You jumped over the top of them. Exactly. So, Senior year, were you a stud? Well, they moved me to running back and changed my number to 42. So, Coach Young, Donnie Young was recruited me and coached me. I owe everything to Donnie Young. There's no doubt. So, he kind of lost track of me because they were recruiting a kid at Winfield, and Jack Eastwood was Mr. All-World from Nitro, and, and a guy named Haywood Smith from Dunbar. Wow. And, all those and kids they kind of lost me because the year before, I was a tight end. My number was 83, and they changed it to 42. Right. I don't know why they're both. What about what about when they've seen running back? When they've seen you on huddle on the huddle tape? When they've seen you, they Leon McCoy, the great Leon McCoy, absolutely was probably one of the biggest reasons I ended up playing because every time they come to see his tight end, he say you got to go over and see me. And the funny story was I had to be six foot tall. They weren't going to they weren't going to recruit me. So Danny Young, you know how Danny talks. Danny came over and said. We need to measure him. Well, I had socks. I had socks on. That maybe had about six rolls of tape underneath the heels. Did you? I'm five eleven, but I was six foot that day. <laughs> <laughs> you taped up your aunt. You taped but up you your heels. You understand back then there was forty two in my class. I mean, back then they. I don't think there was any number restrictions. So that was the uh, Alabama Bear Bryant system. Bring in as many as you can. Try to kill half of them and run them off. And whoever's left would be good players for you. And that's exactly what happened. There were 42 in your class. 42, yep. 
And believe it or not, 36 to 38 of us were still there. That, our class stuck together. You guys and are still we tight to this day. Talented. We weren't near as talented as the 74 class, but the 75 class, my class, we ended up winning nine games. And going to the Peach Bowl. You know, back then, you know how many bowls there were in 1975? Not many. 11. 11 bowls. 11. What is there now, 34? Mm, uh, over mid-30s. Yeah, yeah. yeah mid-30s. Well, it's ridiculous whatever it is now. So. Do you think if you didn't put the tape on your heels that they wouldn't have offered you? If you were, seriously, if you were 5'10", 5, 5'11", 5, they wouldn't have offered? Well, if Donnie believed in me, he'd probably laugh for me. So, hopefully, I don't know. <coughs> well, there goes there goes a the social distancing. Um, <laughs> it was a, it was a good was, use of the mask, though. It was an edict from Coach Bowden. I'm sure the head coach. That's what he wanted. So you, that's really super interesting. You play, you hardly play linebacker. You move you to tight end, and change numbers. So you're like, that's really interesting. So so Leon would say, go look at go look at the Dunlap kid, and Donnie would come down. And he searched you out. Exactly. So, and here's another thing that's very interesting. After I signed, I came home one time, and my mo mother said, Coach McCoy called, and he wants to talk to you. Well, we, you know, we're bitter rivals. All right. I had two personal fouls, two 15-yarders for yoking the quarterback up in the bleachers <laughs> in, the, in the first half of the game. And this, <laughs> Coach McCoy came over and started hollering at me, saying, you know better than that. So, right. He didn't curse because that wasn't his deal. John Spencer was sitting up in the stands with his head, helmet turned sideways. So. <laughs> but anyway, he called He called maybe in uh, April and told me, I called him back, and he said, you need to come over here and work out with me because you know, he was famous for his weight room. Yes. He, he had stuff in, there that was 20, 20 years ahead of everybody else. And he, he, took, he, he took me over and worked me out. And I worked out with him all, every summer. You know, we didn't stay there during right. the summer like you do now. Right. And he worked me out every every year. Tried to kill me, but he, was, he made you he made you a player. He sure did. When you got <laughs> to when you got to West Virginia, you're undersized and you're one of forty two kids in mm -hmm. the class, and obviously there's all the guys, the upperclassmen that are ahead of you. Yes. Did you have an did you have a uh oh or a aha moment or did it ignite your fuse? What ignited my fuse is they brought the freshmen in three days early like they used to. Yeah. And we're all sitting in the bleachers when we first get there. And we're all talking to each other. And then the coach comes in. We had to stand up and say you know, our name, where we're from, and what we play. So, of course, you know, I weighed 188 pounds, by the way. I mean, we got corners bigger than that now. So, so I was sitting against these two other guys that played linebacker too, and one was 225 and one's 230. And I stood up and told him, and after we did all this and we broke up, and he looked at me and says, there's no way you're a linebacker. you got to be a safety or running back or something like that. Well, that lit my fuse from that day on. You know, I, I had something to prove, you know, when you're a little guy and you had something to prove. And never lifted weights. I mean, I was farm strong from putting up hay and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I found a weight room. And uh, had a great coach. Donnie Young was as good a coach. I mean, I learned a lot of things I did in my coaching was because of what he did. And he used to say, if you, you can survive 30 minutes of, of my individual every day, you're going to be a player. So I was crazy enough to like it. <laughs> that, so. See, there's another example. Yeah. How many people have we talked to that it's one conversation, right? Almost a passing comment. That kid that said that to you probably has no idea that the fuse he lit in well, you by saying that. Well, well, in, in the long story short, that one guy was kind of a sissy. He, he didn't like to get hit. And I went way out of my way to hit him because <laughs> we used to do what we call bull in the ring. They make a five-yard yeah, circle. Yeah, 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 you yeah. get in the middle. Yeah. You could point out whoever you wanted. I pointed him out three times in a row and tried to kill him. <laughs> All right? And he outweighed me 30 pounds. Yeah, and you, get, you, get, you, gave, you, gave him the old, uh, you gave him the old hurricane shuffle, huh? Exactly. Yeah. So, and the other guy next to me became a – Dietrich, believe it or not, and he played nose guard because he got fat and weighed 260, and he never played. So, you know, yeah. it's not where you start. And I always tell my players that it's where you finish. So if you've got the mindset and the drive and the determination, you can, you can play this game.
What was Bowden like when you got there? What was that whole deal? I like? don't know. He's always with the offense. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> he was always with the offense. But every once in a while, during practice, especially the individual, he would go about halfway up an old mountaineer field and sit in the bleachers, and you would swear he's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking at me. I know he was. So. But how was it? What was the culture like in the thing? Was it? Uh, what was that like? I mean, you're, you got to think about this, man. Physical. All hitting. All the time. It was just physical. It, 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 they checked your manhood every day, which t in today's football, you know, well, first of all, guys are bigger, stronger, and faster now. Right. I mean, there wasn't probably 50, 60 pounds difference between all of us. Well, now you got 325-pound lineman and 180-pound corner. Something's got to give. Right. So it is a little different. I, I look back when Bruce Bosley, he was a beast. I mean, he was a great player. He weighed 235. And that defensive tackle at 225 was Sam Huff. Well, you know, the corners probably weigh 170, so there wasn't really a lot of difference. When you got you get that disparity in size right. and strength and speed, these guys work out year-round. They're fast, and, and believe me, everybody says, well, back in the old days, they, kids were tougher. No, bull, bull. These guys are big, and they're very fast, and they're physical. And, and like I said, the bone structure hasn't changed in the ligaments. Something's got to give sometimes. Yeah. Who was your defensive coordinator? Chuck Clausing, legend. Chuck Clausing, yeah, He's a legend. Yeah. Let me tell you a great story about this. We're down the goal line, and to close into the stadium it is extremely no noisy, right? We're on the goal line. We're like on the two yard line. Yeah. And Chuck would do this. You know what that means? <laughs> tell that me. I mean, stay with me. I don't. I'm. What the hell? We only had two calls. Okay. <laughs> the goal line this or goal line that. So he kept saying, "Stay with me." They they broke a huddle. So I just turned around and called a defense. <laughs> <laughs> well, he met me at the hash coming off. <laughs> Did you get a stop, though? Was that a good call? Yeah, we saw well, <laughs> Thank God. I'd probably be benched for life. <laughs> so, so he met me at the hash, and, and he, he, you didn't know when Chuck really got excited, started, st you know, like, started talking, the spit started flying. It's like, I had to wipe my face off. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was uh, – he was, he was a tremendous coach. you got to tell me more about Bowden. He's one of the greatest coaches in the history of the game. What was that like? After he left here. I know. Did um, he learn? Did he, he, he often says that he learned how to be a coach here. Yes. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Did you know that when it was happening? Well, I mean, I think any time a first-time head coach in a Division One program, you're going to make mistakes, and you're probably going to learn from I don't care who you are or what the situation is, but um, he he believed in the old old school, you know, the Bear Bryant, the, the physicality, challenge or manhood, and, and make a man out of him and all that sort of thing. So that was that was part of it. But he was such an offensive coach that uh, he just didn't spend a lot of time on, on the defensive side of the ball. But we that was okay. I mean, we never thought anything of it. I mean, we had a job to do, and we had good coaches, and, you know, did what you had to do. Disciplinarian? Uh, well, back then I think you were a lot more disciplined now, but you can't get away with anything now. I mean, there's cameras and phones, and and uh, we go. You could get away a few things, but then but nobody'd find out. But <laughs> it was it wasn't anything bad, but it's just mischief. Yeah, mischief. General, just general mischief. Yes. Was it hard sitting out your first season? We didn't. We had a we had a JV team. So okay, but you know freshman, you don't play varsity. But you, matter of fact, 1972 was the first year that freshmen were eligible, and I think maybe uh, Artie Owens, he's such a great player that he played a little bit, and very few guys did. We had a, actually had a team. We played we played four games. We played a uh, Pitt. We played Potomac State. Believe it or not, I don't remember the rest of them. But anyway, we played we played four games. So you got four in, kind of get a little feel. Yeah, let me tell you another story because we lost one of those games. I think we lost to Maryland. And D George Duke Henshaw, another another legend, he was the JV coach, and he was he was probably just out of college. He he I think he played in the '69 uh, Peach Bowl, and he was a defensive tackle. And he was a he was a tough guy, and we we lost that game. And he was so mad at us that after practice on a Monday, he kept us out there and. Full pads, and we started running the 40s. And it's almost dark, okay? 
I think we run, I think we're like 25 or 30 of them with full pads. And Coach Bowden walked over and whispered in his ear, and he told us to go in. I think he would have <laughs> killed us all. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a different day back then. It, was, it really was. When you finally got to play sophomore, junior, senior, what was it like playing at Old Mountaineer Field? Loud, extremely loud, and right on top of you. I mean, believe it or not, it's only five yards from the sidelines. To, to the bleachers. So kind of like Oklahoma and, and, State and, is now. Exactly. And, and But the wall wall was only like six feet high. So if, if they said you suck, Dunlap, you suck, <laughs> you could hear it because they're right in your ear and they're right next to you. There's no question about it. I mean, but that's what made it unique. And that means 35,000, you say, oh, it couldn't be that loud. But it was, it was loud because it was close. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now the turf, and let's talk about another thing. I was going to get into that. That Aster turf, that's like, it was like sandpaper. It was awful. My first time I slid on, I took all the hide off my shin. I mean, it would just burn the skin right off of it, and it was hard, and it was it was uh, nothing like it is today. Yeah, you still move pretty well though. No lingering effects from getting beat up on that turf. Well, remember, I didn't play that much football. I didn't play hardly any in high school. So, I played baseball a lot. I thought I was a baseball player. Who who knew? <laughs> it was a hard turf. It was like a little carpet pad with a. It was bad. It's terrible. It was I mean, bad. I remember that. Remember the old old Pitt Stadium? They had that stuff. It was awesome. I mean, it, it, it ain't much. It's not, ain't much different than Formica. <laughs> it's got yeah, the little top close. on it. Other yeah, than that, yeah. it's Formica. Yeah, it's bad stuff. How is your body? How's what? Your body. You got any, do your knees hurt you? Your ankles hurt you? Your hips hurt you? You're you're pretty good. The only thing that bothers me my hands. I'm starting to get some arthritis, and my thumb doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It, it, I was at Syracuse, and I got up one morning, and I thought my thumb was asleep, and it wouldn't work. And I, By 10 o'clock at, at, at work, I started figuring there's something wrong with this thing, and I went over, and they took me to get an x-ray, and it says, looks like your wrist had been broken two places a long time ago. <laughs> you mean like the 70s? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and what happened? I got bone spurs, and it's, it severed the flexor tendon in my thumb. Yeah, the thumb, <laughs> thumb kind of called it quits there. Huh? I don't need it. I'm left-handed anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They said you could fix it, but it would be a six months recovery. And this was in April, and I, that would cut all the fish out in the summer. <laughs> so that, that made that decision really easy. So, yeah, solid move on your part. Well, you're right, though, as long as it's not your left hand. You ever seen his handwriting? The, the, the best, prettiest handwriting in the state of Western. I'd put him up against anybody. Really? And still likes to write. Game day when he comes into our show, he'll have 112 pages of handwritten notes. It's all perfect. I remember writing. he used to take me into his office and on the chalkboard. You used to you used to draw it up for, for this. Him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, who was the greatest? Would have been nothing without me. There's no question. There you yeah, go. you taught me the game. Who's the, who's the greatest player you ever played against? Played against personally? Yeah. Not coaching, just you. Like You're on the field and some guy whizzed by you and went like, "Oof." Um, Chuck Muncie. Wow. That's from mm, one of them. That's a good one. Yeah. University of California. We went out there and we beat them. We're in the goal line. They they were we were in the goal line. We we're playing defense and they're in like the two yard line and they they ran a dive or something with Chuck. He's six four. He weighed two twenty five. Wow. So I'm gonna lay him out. So I dive to hit him and there's a I have a picture with me and my my head was pointing his legs and I got to hold the back of his knees. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> did he did he score? And Tony Dorsett. Yeah, he was good. Huh? fantastic player i mean you talk about a guy that accelerate you know he only weighed 160 pounds when he was a freshman he only weighed 190 when he was a senior and they would they said that he'll never make it in the nfl yeah uh-huh yeah. sure yeah so yeah he was a great player how hard was it for west virginia to win when you were here based on the stadium based on the whole deal pit bringing in recruiting classes of like, you know, well, just Pitt's enormous been a, numbers yeah. of players. Well, Pitt's been a yo-yo all through the years, as long as you can mirror. From national champion is absolute awful, and they've always been that way, and I really never understood why because back then it was just such a gr- great recruiting area. There would be 51A recruits every year out of Western PA. So, you know, if they got just get their share, they should be fine. But they would just self-destruct themselves for some reason. You ever noticed that? They're mm-hmm. really good or really bad and never in between. But West Virginia, in my opinion, has always been an overachiever. You know, and maybe because of the, just the pride or good coaches or whatever it was, or we had something to prove because of our little state. I don't know what, it, what, the, what the situation. But you've looked what we've done through the years. There, there's no doubt 
that uh, we've competed pretty pretty well through the years. Now, are we always going to have great teams? No. But, you know, West Virginia has to bring in the recruits that, that, that aren't going to always uh, – be the what do you call them five stars and four stars but you know like i said where you start is not always where you finish and west virginia through the years have done a great job of developing players i don't i can't tell you how many players like we would recruit like her lavish in pennsylvania or 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 uh dave mcmichael to bring a six five guy that weighed 235 pounds and he walks out of here 300 pounds yeah. in a second round draft pick and and that that's also credit to Donnie Young. He had a great eye. He was our recruiting coordinator. And he had to prove every player, and he had a great eye. That's all he did. He didn't go on the road. He sat in an office and watched film all day. I would kill myself if I had to do that. But he did that, and he did it really well. Yeah. So, now I worry a little bit about the, the time you can spend with them, you know, and challenging them, and all those sort of things, of as far as developing players. You know, they've cutting all that down. You yeah. Can't, now you can beat them till they till till your eyes fall out and watching film and all that stuff, but that's not like being on the field. It's just not the same. Let's, we'll jump around a little bit as we do on this podcast. We'll come back to your playing days a little bit, but when in there did you decide that coaching is where you were headed? Well, I started out as a psychology major, and I don't know what I was thinking. I took my first class, and I was like, whoa. Then I, then I changed a business major, and, and I didn't like that. So <laughs> I ended up having to take another semester just to graduate. And – Donnie Young, again, Donnie Young, Donnie Young's been everything to me, but Donnie Young would said to me, it was, it, I graduated in December 77, so what do you do in the winter? He says, he said, uh, you know how Donnie talks, talks like this? He said, well, why don't, why don't you be a GA? We'll pay your way to grad school. I said, okay. He said, what? So, uh, safety studies. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, anyway, all, all that took was, when that spring football has been a graduate assistant, then I got the bug. I mean, it, I got it bad. Had you thought about it before Donnie came to you? No. You, it no. had never crossed your mind? Really? You just thought you were done no, playing, you're going to go get a job. Playing, and I love being a part of the Mountaineer football program and all that stuff. I just never thought it was in the cards for me. And all of a sudden, he gave me that opportunity. And, and I just took – I didn't realize how much I really loved the – what I really liked is, is the X's and O's. That's, that's what used to fascinate me. I just – Absolutely love the big chess game, you know, and 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 I've always been that way. That's yeah, something, that's something I really enjoy. Well, that, wait, that's well, what everyone while, knows you for. Well, yeah. as a coach, while playing though, was it the same way when you're playing? It was the X and O part, I or no? Where, I knew where everybody was supposed to line up, and, and if they weren't lined up right, I'd basically tell them. And sometimes it didn't w vote well for me. <laughs> it smashed me in the mouth or something. But yeah, I, I just didn't realize that I had the gift for that. Yeah, whatever it was, I think I think a lot of people fall into what they do. You know, some people say I've always wanted to do this. Well, well, if you don't have the talent for it, yeah. So, anyway, you're really interesting in the sense that you played here during that last year, those last years of old Mountaineer Field. Mm -hmm. You're with Coach Signetti, as you said. You become a GA. Then back then they had what they called a part time assistant coach made that right you, you made that and so you're here then coach Nealon comes in 80 so you see a coaching transition between Signetti and Nealon obviously you had never heard the name Don Nealon until he was hired then he gets here what allowed you to stay what are your first recollections of meeting Don Nealon well, first of all I call him Nealon which didn't go over very well <laughs> You gave him the nay like instead this. of the knee. It's kneeling. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, um, well, I started to find out what coaching is all about. It's day to day, and, you know, you better be ready to move. And then started, I learned that lesson real fast. And uh, it's probably because of Donnie Young. He, he kept me. I, Donnie, he, he put Donnie on probation because yeah. Gary Tranquil was the defense coordinator that moved the offensive coordinator. Because he previously coached with Don at, at Bowling Green, and uh, he he probably he helped Donnie stay, and Donnie helped me stay, I'm sure. But I, the, it was a great story. When Don first came here, he we had to recruit uh, Rich Walters from Shaler High School. Now, here's how you get to Shaler. It's north of Pittsburgh. You go nowhere and you turn left. That's how you get there because it's impossible to find. I still. 
I still have nightmares. You find the busy beaver and turn left. Uh, it, was a, it was a lumber company or something. So I had to pick Don up the airport. I'm a GA. I am so freaking nervous. And, and dumb me, you should, I should have driven there first to find it, right? <laughs> so we have the assistant coach, Carl Battershell, at the school waiting for Don to come. And I'm driving, and I get lost. And there wasn't there were no phones or cell phones that had a map. You didn't pull up navigation on your phone. You didn't have the yeah. GPS on there. Huh? <laughs> I had nothing. Yeah. And it's like, and so said, you're sweating, kneeling, sitting oh, over there. I said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. So, you know what he did? This is the kind of guy, Don. What he just he tapped me. Says, "Don't worry about it. We'll be fine." And it's just a, that's the kind of guy he was. Really yeah. amazing. Yeah. So. so you you stay here for two seasons. You stay here the, his first year and his second year. And then you mentioned Gary Tranquil a moment ago. Then you went up with Gary Tranquil at Navy, right? Yep, U.S. Naval Academy. The greatest, one of the greatest experiences in my life to be around those kind of kids. How special they are. And uh, they're the best of the best. Amazing. D-line coach, 82 and 83. Yep. How'd that go? Whatever you said, they do. I had good players. Yeah. Nick Saban's defense coordinator. How's that? Nick Saban was? Yeah, we get along real good. Mm -hmm. You, <laughs> Napoleon Kaufman there then? Napoleon? Yes. yes. Not the Kaufman, the McCallum. Yeah. Napoleon McCallum, right? Napoleon McCallum was there McCallum, at that time. Yeah. Boy, he was good. Yeah. Oh, he was good. Oh, yeah, he was He was a great player. Yeah. But our schedule is just it is brutal. I mean, you name we played them. We played, we went Arkansas and South Carolina, B.C. I mean, just. Syracuse. Yeah, Syracuse. Believe it or not, I was a student. Uh, not funny. I was a student. <laughs> I was a student and did the game from Navy did when it? you were there. I just put the I just put all the math together because Syracuse played them in 80, 80, 83, 83 at Navy. It was an unbelievable atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. The march on. The march on is just fantastic. So then, how did you get back to WVU? You spent two seasons at Navy, and then what was the call to get back here? Bill McConnell. He he was the secondary coach, and he left. And I think he went to the USFL. Pittsburgh Maulers, if I'm not yeah, mistaken, yeah. right? Yep. And uh, and I got along really well with Dennis Brown. He was a defensive coordinator. So Dennis said uh, he would move back to the secondary, and I'd come back and coach the linebackers. Two okay. similar personalities, you and Dennis Brown. Both wise asses. Somewhat. And I say that in the nicest Somewhat. way. I say that in the nicest Somewhat. way. Right? Right? Somewhat. Good game. But you know, got that, got that. Don't lack for confidence. Got a little edge. Got a little, got a little edge. I love Dennis. Dennis was great. He'd go in there. You, you'd love him. You go into his office. He Remember, was cocky. Cocky as heck. Cocky. Yeah. Uh, before West Virginia played TCU in the '84 Blue Bonnet Bowl, uh, it was after the game after. So West Virginia wins that game, beats TCU down there in Blue Bonnet Bowl. The reporter asked Dennis a question. Dennis said, "I don't know." Um, perhaps someone thinks that they invented the game of football in Texas. No, that's Dennis. Yeah, yeah that, that would be him. They just kind of, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hold on, you got to turn it back a minute. You got to turn it back. He said Saban was defensive coordinator. We got to get a little of that in there. Yeah, jump in. We get, before we come back to West Virginia, give us a little Saban. He offered me a deep. job twice at Michigan State, and I didn't go there. So what else you need to know? Okay? So he doesn't well, talk. Hard, hard to work for? Oh, you think? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like going to prison. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Two, three squares a day, and that's it. You're out. I mean, I don't dislike Nick, but he's very driven and very difficult to work for. So, especially coach of secondary, that's like suicide watch. That so, was his position, right? Yes. That was his thing. You know everything. Just ask him. <laughs> like, are here, you, here's another thing. Are I you two boys? Like, if he saw you right now, would it be? Uh, what would that conversation be like? Be fine. Yeah, you guys are good. But to hear the th the thing. I, I decided when I was coach, I wanted to be a coordinator because I loved the X's and O's and all that stuff. But me and me and Nick would bun heads because he never coached a defensive line. And we, he would tell me I should do this. Well, my guys are giving up 50 pounds to this guy, and you think I'm going to squeeze the guy back or do something like this. He, I'm going to disengage him. We're athletic, and we're going to run. And they run a belly, which is the inside zone, and my guy swam over the tackle. And create a big gap inside, and then the, and the and the fullback squared out. And he told me hey, we had to squeeze it back. I said, Paul Swords is 250 pounds. That guy's 295. Really? I mean, what I what I'm saying to you, when I the, when I wanted to be a coordinator, I wanted to make sure I coached every position so I understood 
the difficulties, what was hard and what was not hard. So when I had an opinion about something, right. I experienced it. Right. And I, I've coached every position previously. Yeah. To, to be yeah, I get you. So, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes so. sense. So you waited your turn here. You come back. Dennis eventually leaves. I'm trying to remember. Did you get elevated as soon as Dennis left? or do No, we? Bob Shaw. Bobby, Bob Shaw. That was the 88 – that was the '88 season. Bob was a Bob was a wonderful character, wasn't he? Ducks were on the pond when he came. <laughs> the men were here. Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing too, because Don, Don, you know, we had everybody coming back. That '88 80 team was probably the greatest team that ever walked on a Mountaineer field. As talent, there was 12 guys drafted. Yeah. And and Don said, "We're not changing our defense. You teach it to Bob." What? Oh, okay. <laughs> So we as a staff, you know, me and Kralav, we had to teach him our defense. So it was uh, very unique. But, you know, we did what we had to do. And, you know, the rest is history. But, you know, that's 19, 1988 team is the only time I ever, ever bought in to the players. You know how they are when they're in meetings. They'd say, we'd be watching film. They said, hey, we're playing Temple. These guys suck. We're going to kill them. And I, I would get so mad because anybody can beat anybody now. Well, believe it or not, the 88 team, when they said we were going to kill him, I said, how much? <laughs> I was right in there with them. I, I, you know, the average winning margin was 22 points oh, a game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I, to this day, Major doesn't get hurt. We run Notre Dame's butt off the field. There's no question, no doubt in my mind. That was, that was a juggernaut of a team. We had everything. We had tight ends, receivers, great offensive line, defense. We had, we had it all. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing bunch of kids. And Bo Orlando run the show. Let me tell you another story. We're playing Penn State. We got them, I think, 42-7 and a half. Okay? That defense is probably good as the 96 defense, except they didn't play all the time. Right. They'd play half a game or three quarters, and they'd come out because we're the winning margin. Okay? So The 88 team, you mean? The 88 yeah. team. So yeah. we're playing Penn State. We got them 42 uh, the seven and a half. And, we maybe played them two or three series in the third quarter and took them out. And as Kalav would say, we put the scrubs in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we put the scrubs in, <laughs> and they run up and down the field. I think they scored either 21 or 28 yeah. points, and Bo Orlando is losing his mind on the sidelines. He wants to go back in. So anyway. So, so is he in your ear saying, get us back in? He wanted to put up the starters back. I know. Is he telling you that? He's up yeah. on you saying, get yeah. us back he's, in he's here? He's like a lunatic. So we have a Monday meeting, and we're going over the, like, you know, this who's the player of the week and stats and this and that, whatever. Then after defense meeting, we break up and go to individual meetings. So we get done, and we're getting ready to break up. And Bo says, Coach, just, I, I want to talk to these guys for a second. You've, you know the setup. We had the, the room. <laughs> Those right rooms. next to it's a meeting room. Of course, all the coaches scurry around, and they get <laughs> up against the door. Go ahead and hear what he's saying. Yeah. We're listening. And I, I have, well, yeah, you can't, I can't say it here, but he, 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 he shook them up. He basically said, if you don't get it done and you don't stop when we put you guys in, we're coming back in. Three weeks later, playing Rutgers, same thing. Here they go, run up down the field again. They get down to like the 10 or 15 yard line. I'm standing right next to Kralavin and, and Coach Neal. And the next thing you know, he sucked Don, himself Don in. Don says, What are you doing? I said, I didn't do anything. He says, Who put him in? I said, Bo did. <laughs> subbed his guys in. He brought, they went in. Brought the cavalry, brought subbed the cavalry guys back in. in. Yeah, he, subbed, he, he ran on the field going like this. <laughs> and he, he had stopped enough. him. He stopped him and came back. Okay. Uh. That's, so that, that's when you know you got a team. They they ran the team, and they were they were very very special bunch of guys. Oh, that was an unbelievable run! Don't you think the success that you guys had in that stretch was all because you coaches stayed together for so long? Well, remember when you were trying to run me off the podium for the Hall of Fame thing? Yes. I was trying to tell everybody that when, when they gave I had you five minutes. I took they gave you five minutes. Yet. Did you finish yet? I was I was going <laughs> to well, go I'm back over to the building yet. today to see if you got done yet. I was going <laughs> to. I mean, I don't, I don't think you spoke too long. I, when you got done, I said, Steve, I could listen to you talk all day, and for a while there, I thought I was going to have to. Was... <laughs> well, anyway, uh, what I talked about in there was was the Big Five, and, I, and to this day, I still believe that there wasn't a better defensive coach alive than Bill Bill Kerlavich. There just wasn't. I mean, 
and it was more than X's and O's. You had to be a tough sucker to play for him. I mean, and he'd make him stick her snoot in there, you know. <laughs> so, and and a and a really good recruit. We had a lot of great players. Oh from yeah. PA. Then we had Dave McMichael was there for eighteen years. All these guys from during eighteen to nineteen years. I don't how many how many Western PA kids we had are great players. Mm-hmm. Okay, plus how many All Americans did he coach? Okay, then. We got Doc Holliday. There, here comes our skill from Florida. He got in there early, nineteen, I think, eighty-two. He started recruiting down there. Okay, unbelievable. Then um, Donnie Young. You know, you know what Donnie done, and and then and, and me. There was five of us that were always there. Yeah, you can fill in the other four. It, it didn't really matter to us. Yeah, it was like a well. It was a well, well timed. It was a well timed clock that you guys had going. We're all there because we wanted to be there. You know. A lot of guys had opportunities to leave, you know. So, you, to me, the grass isn't always green on the other side. Everybody thinks it is. Just because you make a few more bucks, it don't make you happy. It really doesn't. So, why, so stay on that. Why not? Why stay here so long? You had, you had chances to go other way. You had some great defenses. Yeah. Could have sprung, sprung you somewhere else. Why the stay? The only place I, I, I have second thoughts about after the 98 season, I, I offered a linebacker job at the Browns. I didn't go because what was I thinking? I thought I was going to be head coach. What was I thinking? Okay, stop so, there. Who was the head coach of the Browns at the time? That's when they started football back again. Uh, Chris, little guy. Uh, trying to remember. So that's after they had left and then came. They yeah. went to Baltimore, then they came that's back. That's the other reason. You know, they, they had to rebuild that whole team again. I wasn't crazy about that, but they offered me a lot of money. I was driving down the high turnpike. My palms were sweating. I mean, and you said whew. no thanks. No thanks. Because at, and, at and, that point you're thinking you're you were thinking I'm going to be a head coach yeah. at the Division One level. That's where you really wanted to be. Well, I thought I had a chance. I mean, what else you got to do to be a head coach of West Virginia? I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know that works. It's luck of the draw. It's like trying to win the lottery. You think you would have liked pros, like the NFL? No, because I don't negotiate very well. I see a lot of guys coaching the NFL like to negotiate with their players. Well, would this be better for you to do it this way or that way? I'm not good at that. I, I watch you play. This is what you need to do. And and you now so Chris Palmer was the coach. Chris Palmer, yeah, that's yeah. Who Chris was. Palmer. He was he replaced. He Belichick. was not happy with me when I told him. So, and you know something, you know, it's your family too. My family took a lot more president over over me. You know, jumping around, and making you know, because everybody says your kids will be fine. Well. My kid, when we moved to Syracuse, my son was in ninth grade going into the 10th, which is a critical time. He's 15 years old. Yeah. And he just tore his knee up playing football in the ninth grade. He had surgery. And, 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 and it's hard on kids. So I was never crazy about wanting to move. And matter of fact, after that first year with Dwight Freeney, he made us really good coaches too at Syracuse. <laughs> we went 10 and, 10 and 3, and, 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 and Tommy Bowden offered me the Clemson job. So – I come back from the airport and I went and picked Matt up at the school and I said, guess what? We're going to Clemson. I, I, he threw every book and page and just flipped out in the car and says, I'm not going through this again and all that stuff. So don't think it doesn't affect kids. It really does. Sure. It does. And everybody thinks it's okay to fire a coach. You know, it's, you know, in society today, it's okay. You know, that's just what coaches do. Well, it isn't okay. We have families too. How difficult was it after all the years you were at WVU Coach Nealon retires. You end up at Syracuse with Pasqualoni. I would imagine that there were times there early on that you said, where in the heck am I here? I want you to know one thing. I pretty much wore blue gold my whole life, right? Even Navy was blue and gold, right? (laughs) Yeah. So we went to the first practice at Syracuse in the spring practice, and I went to the bathroom, and there's all these mirrors, and there's nobody in the locker room. They all left. And I, I went, I turned and looked, and I had that orange on. I was like, wow. Yeah. It's a shock. I you hear know? you, man. And I want you to know something. That, that man, Pasqualoni, was a fine man. He, he really, he made me a better football coach. He really did. And I, How and so? I, well, everybody said, you can't work for him. He's too tough and this and that and all that stuff. And Because, you know, I had guys, that, friends of mine that worked for him before. And what I basically come to find out, if, if if you didn't know what you were doing, you were probably in trouble with him. But if you knew what you were doing, you get along fine. And I got along perfectly fine. I really enjoyed my time there. Yeah. 
you matched wits through the years when West Virginia played Syracuse with their legendary <laughs> offensive coordinator. George DeLeon. George DeLeon. That was always like the great chess match because he was. Amazing. Okay, amazing. So then you go to his, over over to his staff. You're on now, and obviously you're not coaching day to day. So what was that like to finally meet your, to meet your nemesis? Did you struggle he, he early? Was, Did you he talk? was absolutely as crazy as I thought he was. <laughs> That that man, I'm, it was Memorial Day. It was a Monday morning Memorial Day, okay. And and I was going to go fishing, and I forgot my sunglasses at the office, so I can just take another route to get Oneida Lake. Yeah, up there by the airport. Go so, by Manly Fieldhouse. Is that where you were swinging yeah, by? Went, yeah, so okay. I swung by Manly. I went up the back way, <laughs> and you had your office right next to your meeting room. They had these little slot windows. So I come up the stairs and I open the door, and I, I went, started down the hallway to my office. I see a light flicker, and I go like this. There's George breaking down film. It's 7 in the morning on a Monday of Memorial Day. I opened the door. I said, George, what are you doing? He said, ah, I got behind. I have to get this done. I said, it's May. <laughs> 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 then, then he – oh, he's just beautiful. Then, then he would come in. He would come in and uh, – we would do we do scripts, you know, like we'd yeah. script the Practice inside scripts. drill. Inside yeah. drill is just no receivers, just a running game. And he would have his play script. Now, Bill Lager or whoever it was in, back when I was the coordinator, they'd just throw it on your desk. And what I would do, right from left hash to the right hash, they'd, they'd put the same play, just the formations of the right instead of left. So I'd just put a dif different defense. Well, Georgia come in there, he wouldn't give me the script. He would say, boogie bunch, blah, 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 blah. And he'd go, this pencil. I said, what's that? <laughs> he said, then if I wouldn't answer fast enough, here's what we could really use, coach. I said, well, I don't, I don't care what you really want to use. <laughs> <laughs> then we're, I'm, there, I'm, I'm there for a week, and we're going to the orange pack up, up to yeah. Carrier Circle where yeah. the Marriott was. Yeah, yeah. You know how you had that long hallway and they had that canopy? So we had to wear sport coats and ties. So me and George and Paul are going. So we're supposed to be there at noon. So it's like 11.25. I go put, I put my tie on. I'm sitting in the defensive room, and they're in the offensive meeting with Paul. And this is where they did everything. Now, this is February, right? So I kept waiting. I kept waiting. It's 25 till, it's 20 till, it's 15 till, it's 12 till. Here they come. Hey, let's go. <laughs> we all got to get in the cars. He gets on that, he gets on the four lane. <laughs> <laughs> Sliding all over. <laughs> we pull we pull in under the canopy <laughs> and leaves it there. You know that long hallway you walk in? You know that hotel. I remember it. Yeah. yeah. We finally get there, like, oh. <laughs> so you know, Steve and I, blah, 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 and we eat lunch and, blah, blah, and we hear a little talk. He says, "Okay, let's go." <laughs> <laughs> I walk in the defense and Rude Ross said, "Holy!" <laughs> and they all fell on the floor laughing. I said, "Yeah, they're all crazy." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so, beautiful. All right. So if you, if you thought it was weird that you were wearing orange when you're looking at yourself, how weird was it? What went through your mind the first time you lined up and West Virginia's on the other sideline? Oh, I hated it. It was awful. It 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 wasn't the first year we, we were playing them at home, and I'm up in the press box, so I'm kind of detached a little bit. Well, we came there the the next year, and we're, I'm on the sideline looking across at my Mountaineers on Mountaineer Field. Yeah. And I just that was just awful. So, Super weird. Yeah, it's weird. So, I mean, I got to do my job and all that stuff, but you know, just I didn't didn't care for it much. Who would? Yeah. 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 So it's, you have it's that. It's all how your mind works. You know, if if, it, if you're where you want to be and you're happy with what you're doing, you know, that, that's that's all you really need in life. Yeah, there's something there. You leave Syracuse and you go to North Carolina State. Chuck Amata, beauty. <laughs> he was a dude, wasn't he? He was like begging to get fired. I mean – he was so arrogant to the press. No, nobody was allowed to talk to the press but him. You know that? And he was just 
ignorant to him. He'd say, that's a dumb question. Next question. I mean, yeah. So I used to sit there and watch it like, wow. A little bit different what than a little bit place. different little little bit different than Dandy Don, how Dandy Don used a, to handle the media. Different. Yeah, Dan Don was. That's the funny thing about Don Neal that people don't realize. First of all, he loves West Virginia and he didn't move away, and and he he wasn't a different guy when he went behind closed doors. He was still the same guy. He wasn't a phony at all. He was always the same guy. And one thing I always appreciated about him, he was always the same guy every day when he came to office. Some of these guys are like. Polar. I mean, like mm-hmm. Chuck, I, I used to wave this fob in front of that fancy door and it would click every morning. And I didn't know if it was going to be a good day or a bad day because you never knew. Yeah. He was like a yo yo. Like, he just amazing guy. Yeah. And ultimately, that's the place. But that, I had some players that year. Yeah. Who'd you have over there running around? Well, Mario Williams is the first player. <laughs> right and Manny Lawson was the other end. Made you a pretty good coach. Made you a pretty good coach. You can't believe how smart I was. Yeah, I know. That's normally how that works. We we played 50 more plays than any other team in ACC because our offense was that bad. It was a Dunlap curse. Wherever I go, they suck on offense. (laughs) And 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 I think we still end up like seventh or eighth in the country in total defense. That's amazing. And plus, we went the bowl game when we shut out South Florida in the bowl game. Yeah. So crazy. That ends. Right when uh, you leave NC State, and talking about looking over at uh, Mountaineer Field in a different color, now you're wearing green, and you have great respect and great admiration for the folks at Marshall because you were in a situation where you needed a job and they were there for you. Well, timing's everything, Tony. I get I get a call from Oklahoma State a week after I sat down at Marshall. He told me I want to fly out here. I said, I ain't, I ain't, I'm not going out there. I just won't do it. I said, did you want to hear me, hear me on the phone? That's fine, but I'm not going to do that because that make Marshall look bad. Was that Gundy back then? Gundy, yep. Yeah. So, anyway, so one of the big reasons I went to Marshall, I got to stay with my mom for for a year, which is very unique. And I stayed at my sister's house, which is right adjacent to my mom's house, and, and – uh, course i couldn't speed my sister's a chief magistrate <laughs> in putnam county so yeah. she said you get a ticket that you get a ticket <laughs> she wasn't gonna help you no. <laughs> she, she's rambo she you you get nothing so but i got this that year spent my mom and my sister was pretty special yeah that's awesome and the reason i did that is well, we made a deal with mark snyder then that in the off season we would i, I could work four tens and i could get friday saturday sunday off i'm only five hours from raleigh my 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 daughter is going to be a senior in high school, and we promised her when we left Syracuse that we weren't going to move her again, which we didn't. So Wendy stayed home with Megan, and, and I would come home quite a bit. So you'd go home on the on weekends, get an extra I'd day. Home, I'd leave the, Friday, uh, Saturday, Thursday Sunday. night. Yeah, and come back Sunday. But he, the, Mark Mark Snyder is very good to me in that way. One season there, then back to Morgantown. Back to Morgan. Bill Stewart. I met Bill Stewart, Bill Stewart at, at Fairmont State at his apartment at a party, which I can't talk about. But <laughs> it, Mike Michaels was used to be the coach at Buckingham sure, and University sure. High. He's, he, we were very good friends, and he was friends with Stu because they were in the same class. Stu initially came here as a walk-on and figured out he couldn't play here, I guess, and went to Fairmont. And yeah. had a great career there. And I met, that's when I first met him. So me and Stu go back a long, long ways. Tell me what Stu was like back then when you first met him. Because he was wild fun when he was here and he's in his 50s. What was he like then? <laughs> Don't get in an argument with him. You probably get punched in the mouth. <laughs> How's that? Seriously. Intense. Yeah, he was, he was a tough guy. He was, I liked him a lot. He's, God bless him. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. And he was a very honest man. Worked very hard. You know, he used to go out in the desert when he's Arizona State, and it was like 110. He out there running nine miles. He just, I think that one thing that's that's awful hard on your body. His his knees and ankles and yeah. all that running. But uh, he was he was a fine man. Shame what happened. Don't you think? I've always thought this. So Rich wins 11, 11, and 11. Stu wins nine, nine, and nine. And I used to tell Stu this, you, it's impossible for you to be considered a success here 
because no one in the history of Mountaineer football has ever had to follow up what you're trying to follow up. So even if you won 10 every year, they'd say it's not as good as the last guy. The only thing you could do is win 11, and they'd say, well, he's as good as the last guy. He was, he was bound, he was doomed, doomed oh, yeah. because of the expectations well, at that time. That's what Coach Neal used to say, that it's funny, after we came back from the, from the uh, Fiesta Bowl and playing for the National Championship, I'll never forget, because I, I was 35 years old. He said, he said, he said in that table, and I looked at him, he said, he said, I want you to know, guys, it's the worst thing we've ever done. It's like, what are you talking about? He says, expectations. They think we're going to win 11 again next year. I think we won like eight or nine, and that wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So what gets coaches in trouble is expectations because you got to feed the monster. Mm -hmm. If you win eight, you got to win nine. If you win nine, you got ten, and it just it just never ends. That's just society, and that's the way it is. Yeah. Tough. Tough all the so way Stu around. caught it in a bad time. So. You think he died of a broken heart? Oh, I'm sure of it because he absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's very unique. And if you're from West Virginia and you, you get to play for the university, that's always been pretty special for a West Virginia kid. I'm absolutely sure of that. Yeah. I think the stress on him at the end, after he got done here, he felt that he got blackballed as far as looking at other jobs. And I think that crushed him. When he started to look around, probably did make him a hot potato. So I don't know. I just I don't know. It, he was going to be here anyway for his for uh, his, his son because I think he was like a junior in high school mm-hmm. or something like that. He, yeah, he could get to finally see him play. So and it was just it was just a bad deal all around. So. Yeah. Then there was Daniel Holgerson. Yeah, you worked for him. That was fun. Unique. Well, let's just say this: When he first came here, he had no idea how to be head coach. It was it was on the job training. How's that? He treated me well. I ain't been no bitch about that. But uh, you know, it's just hard to jump in a major. To me, West Virginia is a major D- Division One program, and I don't know why you got to go out and take a guy that's never been a head coach when when we we should be able to track guys that have proven themselves as head coaches like coach brown i mean he's impressive what he's done so that showed up where first with dana the lack of experience was where organization organization you know been able to pick um assistant coaches i mean he went he went through like 14 defensive coaches and by the way these these new offenses they're defense killers just so you know they run out there and run three plays as fast as they can and punt it, and you got to go back out on the field. So instead of seven getting f- five five to six possessions each half, you could you could go up to maybe eighteen in a game. But you got to keep going out there, and it's exhausting. You better have some defensive linemen because it's basically a two minute drill, and that's part of the deal. They want to wear people out. You miss it. What part of it do you miss? Well, of course, Donnie Young would t- turn Snow White in the games. Oh, Jesus, it's awful. Yeah, he hated it. He hated the he games. Hated it. Oh, he'd just beat the Snow White. Yeah. Crab would be over there throwing up. And, it, and I that's liked true. the games. Crab like would throw up before oh, yeah, games. He finally got over that, but it was like every, every game he'd throw up. Yeah. Gets, but you loved the games. I loved the games. Because it was your chess match time. Exactly. Um, and this camaraderie with the players, I, I really I really like spring football, you know, where it's just. There's no pressure to go play, and mm-hmm. you know, I like to teach. I think I think coaches are teachers, and they like to teach. That's interesting. And Neil it's Brown really says that. Really fun to watch a kid start to get better. I'll give you another story. There's a kid na- kid named Tim Newsom. Sure, he Mount from, Hope. He's from Mount Hope. He's he's the next to next to the youngest of 19 kids, two moms, one dad. Okay. He was so shy. I would talk to him. He wouldn't look at you. It's Tim. He, you know he. He was just so shy. And his dad made him go to a uh, technical school. Uh, what do you call that? Like a vocational school? Yeah, vocational school in the, in the, in the, in the afternoon because you have to come out with a skill. Well, unbeknownst to him, he needed another algebra. 
So I had to go over and talk to him about it. But he basically had nothing. And next thing you know, he come out of his shell. He ends up coaching. Yeah. And he, you know, all those, you always hear all the bad things. There's, there's a lot more good things in there. Oh, absolutely. A lot more. He also that's had not, the that's not news. He also had the pass breakup in the end zone against BC. Oh my goodness! Now he may have grabbed a little face mask on that I baby. I don't care what he did. <laughs> <laughs> no, the two yard almost, almost fell out of the press box. Remember that, Brad? Oh. Were you here then? When when Tim Newsom? No. He grabbed that kid. He goes up to knock a ball away, game winning th- touchdown pass. He grabs his play the game. Last play of the game. He grabs his dude by the face mask. He gets brings the ball down and the face mask. And and everything goes. Sure. Yeah, not sure. a penalty unless no. it's called. No. One yard line. Did yeah. you ever look across the sideline or over to the other sideline and try and steal body language from a offensive coordinator? Like, did you when you were calling plays and watching games? Did you ever did you ever look across well, and do anything on the coordinators in the box? Did you ever steal anything so from the sidelines? Papers and all their stuff, you know. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time doing that, but uh, I want to know who's in the game because personnel dictates personnel what groupings. You do. Yeah. Okay. So we were playing somebody. I don't remember, but it was the '96 team. Yeah. I mean, you talk about a bunch of players now, and we had the fire zones going, and we had 60 sacks that year. 60. <laughs> so that well, that that can't happen. Well, the year before we had 40. I mean. But anyway, those kids were intelligent and smart and all that stuff. We were playing somebody. They were running people on and off the field in bunches, like three or four. Elijah Long Gino would play the Sam linebacker, okay? 81. Remember Elijah Long Gino? Yeah, sure do. 81. He, he, st- he stood on the edge of the, f- of the huddle. And I'm telling him, I'm telling him on the sidelines, I, I, I don't know who's in the game. I said, you may get a call late. But he says, I'll get it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get out of this chair to do this. He's sitting in the <laughs> Well, Steve. He's watching. <laughs> this, 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 this is Dunlap. This yeah. is perfect Dunlap. Yeah, he's watching. Yeah. He's, he's, he's watching. watching. And I'm, over, I'm, up, I'm 50 yards away. Yeah. And we used to call personnel like yeah. 11 personnel, one back, one tight end. Right. Yeah. So he, he was watching. He, he could see him. He was close. Yeah. So he he turned around and go. <laughs> and he did the whole game. He'd give you the personnel grouping, and then you'd call, you'd call the defense. Yes. Yeah. When you get people getting personnel, they can do certain things. Were if they you, put four wides in a game, I may put six DBs in the game. I want to match up with them. Sure. Were you one of the first guys to use the fire zone stuff? You got that from the Steelers, right? We got ahead of we got ahead of everybody, I think, for as far as the fire zones go. And Mar, Marvin Lewis is probably one of the <laughs> biggest reasons. But you know, it's funny. It's a funny thing. Back then, if you went up there, you would say that they put you in one of those cubicles with the projector. Right, and they'd have all the tapes. Top, they have all their tapes, you know, the cut-up tapes with every, the same fire zone over and over and over and over. And they, they just, and you sit there and watch them. I must have spent a week or two up there. And I want you to know, you can figure it out if you watch the same one over and over and over and over. You can figure it out. And they were really tight-lipped. They didn't want to tell you all the right. And I squeezed a little bit out of Marvin every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but we were doing that in 19, 1995. Caused an absolute mayhem. And then maybe 94, but not, by 96, it's full-blown everything. I yeah. mean, it wasn't just fire zoned. It was a two deep exchanges and all these different blitzes, and we were just coming from everywhere. And it was – it was. I used to sit on the sidelines, and Clav and all those guys were there, Donnie. I just used to say, this is unbelievable. Can this, can this last? I mean, this, I, I, it's just unbelievable. I mean – we just freaking wrecked. I, I remember we were playing Maryland that year, and I looked up in the start of the fourth quarter. You know, they, they were moving the ball. I looked up, and they, that's when they had the, the stats on there. They had 25 yards. I remember one game they didn't, the get game. Over mid, didn't get over midfield. <laughs> I mean, now, wh- why would that happen? Well, the 88 defense was a great defense. Well, offensively, we had a whole, whole young offensive line, we were, and we, we just weren't very good on offense, and we ended up having to – play the whole game because the game every game we played was close as you guys remember and and they're a winning margin maybe six seven points at the most so that's basically why that happened in 96 miami game if they don't forward illegally forward lateral that ball it was legal yeah they don't score do they no no they well, don't don, score well don asked me the sidelines i think i think our punter was standing on the 17 yard line and that's a long way to try to take a go safety. backwards. Yeah. yeah. So, 
He said, can you stop? I said, we did all day. Why not? I said, I mean, we had Mike Logan. We had, I mean, we had we had probably the best secondary that ever freaking walked on Mountaineer Field. The only change needed to be made, and this is the great hindsight, all we needed to do, the punter shouldn't have taken a step. No. He should have caught it and kicked it. Yes. That's all. That would have been enough. Get across the 50. That's all we need. Yeah, done. Yeah. They wouldn't, they, 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 they wouldn't have moved it. They would not have moved the football. They they'd still be trying that, to score. On top of that, who was who's the guy that blocked all the punts for him? Number three. Yeah. I don't remember his name now, but he was number three. And I said, fine, number three. Tremaine Mack. Tremaine Mack. Tremaine Mack. Mm-hmm. And David Saunders, he lines up right outside of him, and he ran right by him. He never even touched him. If you do, if you remember that, there was 30 seconds left in the game. It was dead silence. Mm-hmm. I remember dead it silence. well. I've never seen – 65,000 people. I agree. Sounds. Yeah, dead. It was awful. I, I, I think. I, Except I, Butch Davis's wife right above we, me screaming. We beat them every way but loose. And that's what happened. Yeah. Did so, you uh, Did you have fun doing this? Doing what? This podcast. Did you enjoy it? This is your first podcast. Did What's you? my first one? That, am I invited back? Well, yeah. I got lots of stories. We've got 50 years of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Coming up on 50. You're two years away from 50 years of Mountaineers. Because still around, I don't believe. Yo, heck, you're gonna be around. This is, I mean, this is an oddity to get you here. Summer, summer with Dunlap. I know it's not going well. You're bummed out. You're not out there fishing. I get it. I'll catch up. Do you think it'll be a football season? You guys think? I'm not feeling good. I got serious. I'm seriously down. I'm not feeling good. We can't control them right now. How many you got? 19 more. The the most recent release had 19 more. Yeah. Now, now you're going. You you can bring how many? thousand students back mm-hmm. i mean I, I think it's i think it's almost impossible it's a tough formula right now it, it's, it's a tough hurt, formula it's hurting everybody hurting all the schools it's hurting sports it's like we're living in terrible. a bad dream isn't it man like to think terrible. that to think that right now we're not getting cranked up and getting all excited and getting ready to go and the it's whole terrible. deal well keep your fingers crossed who knows man who knows we really appreciate your time sir thank you very much Enjoy for coming in you. steve dunlap's maiden podcast we, we should point out that we had to start the show twice because when we started it for the first time today, he went into a full cramp. Too much and yard work. I looked over at him, and he had this pain look, <laughs> and, I, and so we just shut it down. So he, he's hydrated. He's good. Bananas, everything like that. Masseuse is waiting outside, and we're going <laughs> to we're gonna get to that. Hope that uh, you guys have enjoyed it. Steve Dunlap, Mountaineer Hall of Famer. And one of the foundational pieces of WVU's football success going all the way back to his playing days from the mid-1970s and all through the Don Nealon run and beyond, then with Bill Stewart, and on and on it goes. Three guys before the game. Brought to us by Burdett Camping Center, the only RV warranty forever provider in the state of West Virginia. Unbelievable selection. Check them out at BurdettCamping.com. Tell them that you're a three guys listener. I mean, all I'm going to say is this. You go there, you tell them you're a three guys listener. Magical things will happen to you. Scouts honor for debtcamping.com. For Steve Dunlap, the Senator Brad Howe, thanks for being with us. Tell other folks about this. Share it. Share your podcast. Spread the word. Three guys before the game over and out. See you.